All right, guys, so now we're on to the, our second portion of this course that relates to industrialization and immigration. In particular, we're talking about 1877 to 1890. I'm sorry, to 1990. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is talking about wealth and power during the industrial age. So before we talk about technologies and advancements that took place, some um, various social issues, kind of a broad spectrum of going on in the time period. Now we're going to talk specifically about wealth and where money is going, who has the money, how will that money translates to political power, and various other things that were revolutionary at the time in the economic sphere. All right, so our first goal is to explain how business industrial leaders accumulate wealth in political power in, and economic power. Goal two, describe the changing role of government in economics and political affairs. All right, another name for this time period was also called the Gilded Age. It's a period in the late 19th century, and the name was actually given by Mark Twain, very famous American satirist and author. Basically, in an illustrator that despite American growth and prosperity, there was a number of major social problems like low income and slum housing. So when something is gilded, um, if you've ever heard of a, a gilded page, it'd be like today what we call gold-plated. So we know what gold-plated is. It looks really shiny and pretty, but really it's a very thin layer of gold over top of something kind of worthless like maybe some brass or something or some other base metal. So same thing here. Mark Twain is kind of calling it the Gilded Age. Well, that wasn't really meant to be a compliment. It was big on the fact that everybody in this area in the time period looked big, fancy, and wonderful, but everything below below the surface kind of just turned to crap. All right, this is a very famous political cartoon during this time. It's called The Trust Giant's Point of View. Now, during this time period, a trust is also known as monopoly. Monopoly is when one company controls all the factors of production and basically has complete control of a market so there's no competition. and They can just make tons and tons of money. It's also illustrative of the fact that during this time, you notice the guy's collar right here says Rockefeller. Rockefeller was the richest man in U.S. history. Basically, he, he would be, he'd outpace Bill Gates by billions of dollars in, in, in today's money. Look at what he's doing. He's taking the White House and he's like taking little pennies out of it. A lot of these people we're going to talk about during this lecture series had more money than the country. Like after the Civil War came happened and after things happened in the late 1800s with various busts and panics related to the stock market, these guys had more money than the country did. They were bailing out portions of the U.S. government because they just had so much wealth. We're talking about a great deal of power being consolidated into not elected officials or government bodies, but just people who would run businesses well and made lots and lots of money. So pause it here for a second, guys. Just pause it, look at the timelines, know what's going on, understand just the timeline and how the Gilded Age kind of levels out from the end of the Civil War with post-Reconstruction all the way to the early, early 20th century. Just pause it here and take a look. All right, there's a cool picture of Mark Twain. Basically, he's given his... He's a very well-thought-of person. Even back then, he was well-thought-of. He was considered very smart. He was anti-imperialist, although he lost the day on that battle with... U.S. government. He was kind of he was a satirist. He was very very well thought of at the time. All right, so during this time period, there was a lot of attempts by progressives, wealthy, various interests, to try to explain why poor people were poor and why there were differences in societies. And then this guy right here, his name Herbert Spencer, took an old concept from Charles Darwin, which was the idea of survival of the fittest, Darwinism that ev that the species that survives is the strongest one and that's why they survived they applied it to society he said we're going to call it social darwinism basically it works a lot like this it's survival of, of the fittest but applied to the business world it's used as a justification of business leaders to prevent growth and government regulation and business practices so the idea is that the reason why rockefeller and carnegie and vanderbilt the reason why they were at the top was because they should be at the top. They're the fittest. They're the best to survive. So it was basically, and that you shouldn't regulate them. You shouldn't do anything to bust up their monopolies. You shouldn't change the way the U.S. government runs because if they're at the top, it happens for a reason. Social Darwinism, survival of the fittest in the business world. Now, Horatio Algier was a 19th century American author who noted who was noted for his dime store novels. Now, back during this time period, like you could buy a book very cheap, and they'd be little short stories in the book. But what's cool about these stories were they were basically these very prominent rags to riches kind of tales. It was like, if you work hard, you can become a senator of the, in the United States. You can become a businessman. Even if you have nothing, you can become something. 
And a lot of this was almost used like propaganda for the poor. They'd read this and feel better about their lot in life. It was used on, in, for uh, recent immigrants coming into the, into our country. They'd hand these books out or they'd be billed very cheaply saying, hey, if you work hard, you're going to advance and grow in society. And that would kind of, in, it was basically just propaganda to keep them working and distracted and making sure they were doing basically what the bosses and people in government wanted them to do. So it's kind of a negative view on history, but the purpose of these little dinosaur novels was to inspire or at least placate people who otherwise might be very upset with their lot in life. It keeps them working because it may, these books teach the lesson that if you work hard, you'll always succeed and you can become something great. And here's an example one. This is very famous from farm boy to senator. And it would be, it would be those kind of stories. They would be truly just rags to riches kind of stories that were that, in a modern context, you're kind of like, okay, yeah, there's that one in a million shot. These books almost made it seem like it's going to happen if you work hard. Like it's a, it was like an inevitability versus a random chance. All right. So with, during this time period, you see an emergence of new power. So there's a guy named George Westinghouse and he was the chief competitor of Thomas Edison and all, and to a lesser extent, the guy named JP Morgan, who was Edison's financial backer. Westinghouse hired a guy named, Nikola Tesla. He's this guy down here. Nikola Tesla is basically the father of our power system. He used alternate. He believed in what's called an alternating current electric system, whereas Edison believed in a direct current electric system. And there's all kinds of crazy stuff. Like it was like for a while, it was like a trade show. Like Tesla would come out and like show lightning bolts hitting his arms, and he wouldn't get hurt by them. And say this, there's no need to fear AC power. And he basically just let lightning bolts that were alternating current electrical fires like smack him in the hands he's like it doesn't hurt see where in and uh edison did other crazy stuff edison tried basically did um as a way to make alternating current look bad or to hurt tesla he actually like electrocuted an old elephant like an old circus elephant they actually electrocuted and killed the elephant with alternating current just a super ridiculous high voltage of it and additionally to, on, on top of that edison is the father of the electric chair which he insisted use alternating current just to make this guy's idea of alternating current look bad. So there was a lot of this back and forth during this time period where it wasn't just the big the big dogs in the financial world fighting each other. It was it was like scientists fighting each other, all trying to get, get a leg up on each other with their various technologies and their ideas. And you should recognize the name Westinghouse because it's still a name we're used today in, uh, te- in text. So like they make t- there's a company called Westinghouse that makes TVs named after this guy. All right, so let's talk about the Vanderbilt family. So if you live in North Carolina, you've probably heard of the Vanderbilt family. Their big thing was railroads. Vanderbilt got control of the railway companies and basically had a monopoly on most railroads. And because of and because most things during this time period traveled by rail, he had a monopoly on movement across the country of any goods worth mentioning. This is a very famous uh, political cartoon based, based the same at Vanderbilt controlling the world at this time, controlling politicians, and those are the two legs, by the way, saying that he was the Colossus, just controlling everything that related to transit, all that fun stuff. And here's Biltmore in Asheville, North Carolina. This is why Vanderbilt's most famous in North Carolina is because he built a house down in Asheville, North Carolina. And by house, I mean, holy cow, that's a gigantic mansion. This guy was extremely wealthy. There's also the Breakers up in New England somewhere. There's he he had several mansions, and now it's a museum that's basically toured. Oh, I shouldn't be there. All right, so we'll go ahead and keep going with Andrew Carnegie. Carnegie's big claim to fame was steel, and the reason why he could claim that and why Pittsburgh is also the home of the Steelers is because of Andrew Carnegie and U.S. Steel. He believed in what was called vertical integration. Vertical integration is when a company buys all its suppliers in an effort to control the means of production, basically creating a monopoly. So what he would do is he bought all the places that would create the various raw goods to make steel. So he'd buy the iron, he'd buy the limestone and the coal, all the things you need to purify and make high-quality steel. He'd buy the shipping facilities related to shipping the steel in and out. Then he'd buy the steel mill. And then he had the integrated steel company. So he owned everything from the bottom up. And that's how Carnegie was able to get his steel monopoly. So it was very important for this course to know vertical integration compared to horizontal integration, which we'll talk about a little bit later. All right, so now we're going to talk about the Bessemer process. Now, as far as impact on 
society of just the Bessemer process or knowing who that guy is, not that important. What's important is to know the implications we all make steel. Prior to this period of time, steel was extraordinarily difficult to make. It required a great deal of heat, a great deal of time to refine. Steel is essentially just iron that's been purified. So during this time period, um, before the Bessemer process, steel would be reserved for like high quality jewelry, oddly enough. Famous Japanese swords or production of sword and metal rifles, weaponry, that kind of stuff is where steel really got its, got its name made. And which is, when you think about it, it's kind of crazy because a lot of guns during this time, rifles, would be made with an in, inferior kind of iron material, which had a principle a little brittle, and these things would be shot out, out of, and they sometimes explode. It was very common during the Civil War, especially because they had such large cannons for those cannons to simply just explode because they're so brittle and not made of steel, but rather made of thick iron. All right, if you want to pause it here and take a look at it, this is the actual Bessemer process explained. So pause it here if you're interested in the chemical and everything related to making steel itself. But what you really need to know, and I'll go back one slide, is the fact that steel being made cheaply, suddenly you had a very strong material that you could build with. Prior to this period of time, the only thing that held up a building was the walls. And the walls were made of brick, masonry, and wood. And maybe there would be some iron in there, like, to reinforce. Now you had a way to build skyscrapers, where before you could, there was a certain limit to the height of a building. The limit basically just went away for all int intents and purposes. So you, the building was no longer being held up by bricks and mortar. It was being held up by steel beams, much stronger, could be built on top of each other. When you combine that with people like Elijah Otis, who created a, basically made it to where elevators could be safely used every day, you now have the ability to build high rises and skyscrapers. So where you had a tough issue with population and density, now you could just build straight up if you had to. So it opened up cities in the modern city to be constructed. All right, so now we're going to talk about J.P. Morgan. All right, so if you ever heard of J.P. Morgan, you might have heard of J.P. Morgan Chase. That's the bank conglomerate nowadays. But J.P. Morgan, the name is still around because he's actually had this huge influence on banking and financing. It's actually a credit card company now. So this guy was basically the biggest banker and financier of the entire of the entire Gilded Age. You're talking about somebody who had billions of dollars at his disposal to basically loan money out and invest. Uh, one chief investment he made was actually backing Thomas Edison in most of his inventions. So um, he went. The original company was called Edison Electric and was changed to General Electric when J.P. Morgan purchased it or purchased out from under Thomas Edison. So he was responsible for a lot of the advancements related to film lighting, all that stuff, but that's his investment side of things. He was also a big banker, who loaned out a lot of money, that kind of stuff. All right, so U.S. Steel, and the reason we talk about U.S. Steel for J.P. Morgan and not for, with Dale Car Andrew Carnegie is because J.P. Morgan purchases Carnegie Steel Company from Dale Andrew Carnegie around 1901 for, for basically what amounts to today would be like four billion dollars, some 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 huge amount of money. Like it's 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 insane. Like I think he actually bought it for back then four hundred million dollars. In today's money, that'd be in the high billions as far as what the value is. So he founded basically what amounts to a monopoly, and he calls it United States Steel Company. All right. As far as the oil industry goes, we're gonna, the reason we're start, starting with drilling oil is because that's where oil comes from. Edwin Drake drilled the first major oil field in Pennsylvania, and that makes sense because even today, if you look at current events, Pennsylvania is ripe for fracking. It's the same kind of system, except they're just getting the oil a little differently. So they found oil in the oil fields in Ohio, the um, Pennsylvania area. It was like the little, it was like the Saudi Arabia of the of the Western Hemisphere. And then you got this guy, John D. Rockefeller. Now he was an oil man, but he was not an oil man like someone who drills the oil from. From uh, Rockefeller's point of view, he viewed business, the more business side of oil, the refining process. Because he knew that if you were the oil guy drilling, you might drill, 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 and never find oil. Or you might strike it risk, rich. There were too many risk factors for him. So what he said, the best way to always make money is to be the guy refining the oil. The one who takes the raw crude oil and turns it into usable products like kerosene, gasoline, and various plastics. Now, this guy has a... Very sore reputation in history. It's also very positive in certain ways. Like currently, there is a grandson of John D. Rockefeller. He's in the U.S. House, so he's he, his family still has a great deal of power and money. So uh, if you any oil company nowadays, Mobil, Exxon, whatever, 
Rockefeller at one point owned a good portion of those companies. Originally, however, he owned a, a very large company called Standard Oil. Standard Oil basically took over through a process called horizontal immigration. Now, horizontal immigration is not like vertical immigration. Vertical immigration is where you control all the factors of production. So you control the raw mines, then you control the refining factory, then you control all the little process factories, and that gives you control from the top down. Horizontal immigration means you take control of a market by purchasing out all competition on the same goods and creating a monopoly. Here's what it looks like. So you don't buy the oil fields. You buy the only way to make the oil usable. In this case, is these small oil companies that were refineries. He'd buy all of those, and then he'd have complete control over the refining market. Now, you might ask yourself, well, what stops somebody from just making their own oil company? How do how they prevent that? And then there's competition again. Well, Rockefeller didn't just have control of oil companies in our country. He controlled oil refineries across the world. And the way he made sure he maintained control of the oil market was he'd go find some mom and pop, just kind of a bad way to say it, some independent oil company or refining place, and say, I'll buy your company for XXX amount of money. They would say, no, we want to keep our refining company and we don't want to sell to you. Rockefeller would then say, fine. He'd then open up his own refinery like right next door and charge pennies on the dollar and put that person out of business. When Rockefeller died, there were, there were a newspaper headline said, well, now we, now that Rockefeller's dead, we know that hell is half full because he had a very, very bad reputation. And Rockefeller was also kind of was very aware of this. If you go back, he became a philanthropist, meaning he donated a lot of money to charity later in his life. Specifically after J.P. Morgan died, it was him and Andrew Carnegie still alive. They were still the big captains of industry at the time. They were the ones who had all the money, and they knew it. They were aware of it. And they were like, oh, God, we're going to die someday, and our legacy is going to be kind of negative because J.P. Morgan's legacy was not terribly positive when he died. So they were like, well, we got to start donating money and being more philanthropic and how we, choosing how to live our lives. So here's Standard Oil's basic moniker right here. This was the biggest trust of the time period. A trust is also known as a monopoly. Basically means he's bought out all competition and he can charge whatever the heck he wants and has control. This company was the target of a lot of the progressive movement. People like Teddy Roosevelt who thought that these people had too much power and were hurting the little guy with like poor wages and other stuff. A monopoly is just a business situation where one con company controls an entire market. This causes high prices and low wages for workers. It causes high prices because if there's no competition, there's no reason to lower your prices down because you're not competing against anybody to keep those prices lower. It also forces wages to be lower because at that point, if you control the oil companies or you can have a monopoly, you also have monopoly on the jobs. So you can say, well, you don't have to come work for dollars an hour but if you want to work and feed your family you're going to work here for two dollars an hour or do nothing and keep in mind this is when society is still at this point in history is not terribly mobile if you're poor you're not traveling anywhere so if you're poor and the only t only job is at a standard oil company refinery in your town you're either going to work there or starve you're not going to be able to get out of town and go find a better job they're also known as trust all right, so here's the famous Monopoly game. You'll notice in, in Monopoly, the head guy, like the the, 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 mop, the Monopoly guy, he's like a rich guy with a top hat and monocle, all that stuff. They're, this is a joke or a play on the idea of being a robber baron or a captain of industry gaining a monopoly on a certain area. And this is probably the most famous uh, political cartoon that relates to Monopolies during this time. This is the... We call it the uh, standard oil octopus or standard oil squid. Basically, he's just they have so much power. They're basically... Standard Oil had so much money at its disposal, so much power, so much ability to influence, and he would like people like Rockefeller would make sure presidents got elected, like uh, Rockefeller, uh, J.P. Morgan, and uh, Andrew Carnegie were responsible for getting McKinley elected in office. So McKinley was in office, and then he was assassinated. But he was very pro business kind of pr president. And these guys were actually responsible through their donations, through their political influence, for getting a president of the United States elected. That's how much power these guys had. This whole idea that with Standard Oil, they just have control over all these places. They control the legislation down here, these guys. They control the Congress. They control the House, the White House. They control shipping. They had so much power because this is where you got your oil from. This is how you, like, how the modern era worked. You didn't, you, you lived and died on oil during this time period. All right, so now we've got to deal with big businesses versus the government. So after a while, uh, and by almost by a fluke, 
Teddy Roosevelt was the vice president under William McKinley. William McKinley was elected in large part because of the influence of the robber barons slash captains of industry like Andrew Carnegie and uh, uh, John D. Rockefeller and of those very, very wealthy people. So McKinley was very, very pro-business. One of the biggest anti-business, anti-trust people out there was a guy named Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt was the vice president of William McKinley. Now you might be saying, okay, why on earth would they make the vice president this guy that thinks just so opposite the president. Well, during this time in history, the early 20th century, being vice president was like not having a job at all. You were there in case the president died. You didn't really have a big influence. Like nowadays, Joe Biden, uh, Mike Pence, they take on a real hands-on role in presidencies. But in the early 20th century, vice presidents were basically just sitting there doing nothing. And, and if you wanted to get rid of somebody who was like really being annoying, let's say to big business people like um, Teddy Roosevelt was to the robber barons, they would say, all right, we're going to make him vice president and get him out of our hair. And it worked until William McKinley got assassinated, making this new anti-business person being Teddy Roosevelt, the president. So an anarchist assassinated the president. Teddy Roosevelt takes over. And now there's an anti antitrust, anti-monopoly person in charge of the government. So you start seeing these trust busting legislation, legislation actions take place. Basically, they were trying to bust up these monopolies. So a number of these companies try to unite but then they basically got busted up by the various courts during, over the next 30 years. All right, so there's two ways to view these people we just talked about, being J.P. Morgan, Andrew Carnegie, Vanderbilt, and the rest. One, po The positive view is that they are the captains of industry. This is a positive perception of business leaders during the Gilded Age. It supports the, They support the idea of philanthropy when wealthy donate, donated some of their money and their profits to charitable purposes. So, again... Carnegie and Rockefeller, in the later years of their life, almost were in competition to see who could give away the most money to more charities. It was really kind of strange. Like you see in the news, it was almost a competition back and forth, a friendly competition, but a competition to see who could be the best person in society. It was a very interesting time period. Carnegie wrote the book, The Gospel of Wealth. It was a belief by Carnegie that basically if you were wealthy, you had a responsibility to do good and help others. Like it wasn't like you got to be wealthy and just go sit in your mansion and be happy and never talk to anybody at all. You, by, by virtue of gaining wealth, gaining power, having this influence over a business, it was your job to do things to help out the rest of the world that wasn't wealthy. Basically, you know, give back a little was the, the essential tenor of this book. Now the negative perception is the robber baron. It's a negative perception of industry leaders during the Gilded Age. When the, it was the idea that wealthy became rich by illegal, possibly, or at least very least unethical methods, like you know, keeping workers down, taking away their rights, that kind of stuff. They try and using uh, comp, anti competition methods to like hurt the little guy. And I can give you some good examples of that. One very famous one. Um, again, during this time period, society was not terribly mobile. So if you wanted to move somewhere, you had to save up for a long time to move. One very very popular thing to do was as a business owner of a factory you'd, you'd establish what's called a company store a company store would be just a store that was grocery it'd sell everything to the people that worked in the factory and what the factories got really good at was well let's not give them money we're not going to pay them in actual money because if they get money they can leave they can go somewhere better let's pay them in coupons so pay them in company store coupons where you could go to company store with your coupons and buy everything you needed you could pay for your rent in the dorm you could do whatever you had to do. The only thing you couldn't do is take that company coupon anywhere else. So you couldn't actually spend the money in other places. So guess what? You were stuck with your wages in the form of coupons at this one company you couldn't leave. And those kind of things were busted up during the antitrust legislation years, and they got rid of those. It was part of like Fair Labor Acts and various other ways to basically make life for laborers better and more fair. All right, so you got a little, little uh, juxtaposition of, of the two robber baron so robber baron is actually a term used back in the middle ages so if you look at the top you'll see that these barons these wealthy people that in the top left and then you see the serfs during the feudal system kind of just paying their 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 homage to the to the robber barons these people were wealthy they would take advantage of the poor and now they're drawing connection to them with the trust and the monopolies and all the in the tariff and legislation that they control because of their wealth and their ability to influence government and you see all these poor folks doing the exact same thing that poor people did hundreds of years ago during the middle ages all right, so a quick summary. Robber barons or captains of industry. Andrew Carnegie was steel. Cornelius Vanderbilt was roads and shipping. John D. Rockefeller was oil. And J.P. Morgan was finance and banking.